So this is a lecture on global gene expression regulation and more specifically um, one type of global rec regulation mechanism called a two-component system um, for April 24th, 2020. And so the goals of this lecture are just to define what a global regulatory system is and then to talk about some specific examples of um, mechanisms of global regulation including uh, two component systems and more specifically the ENVZ OMPR system. And so um, even though bacteria are relatively simple organisms and they're unicellular, they can perform a lot of really complex processes, some of which we've talked about in class already, such as the formation of endospores, chemotaxis, or the ability to move towards or away from attractants and repellents respectively, as well as sort of complex metabolic processes, uh, fermentation, ATP generation, and all of these complex processes require complex regulation at the level of gene expression. And there are specific regulatory systems known as global regulatory systems that can affect many genes at the same time and change the expression of multiple genes um, with one signal. And there are some examples here of global regulatory systems or systems that have multiple genes affected at the same time. Uh, the first of which is seen here, um, it's called a Regulon. And this is where one signal in yellow can act on one receptor. And then that can trigger changes in transcription from, of several different genes by affecting several different promoters down here, A, B, and C. There's also some regulatory systems that don't react to just a specific signal, but rather to a stimulus. And that stimulus can activate multiple receptors and be sensed by multiple receptors, each of which can then affect multiple genes. And then sort of even more complexly, um, there's a, a regulatory system known as a transcriptional regulatory network where there's not only one stimulus or signal but multiple signals all being integrated through multiple receptors each of which has multiple genetic expression outputs and so sometimes we think about um, responding to signals in a very linear way such as this Regulon but really uh, complex processes require regulation more like a transcriptional regulatory network in order to increase and decrease expression of all the genes necessary to complete these complex processes. And so some of the mechanisms for global regulation <coughs> you may have likely seen before and will look similar to cell signaling pathways if you have um, studied those or talked about those in another cell biology or maybe introductory biology class. And so the first mechanism I'm going to talk about is a relatively simple mechanism for global regulation um, involving the use of a single global regulatory protein. And this is where a single protein can affect transcription of many genes, or in the case of bacteria, many operons at the same time. And so one type of um, global regulation that uses a regulatory protein like this is known as a Regulon. And the Regulon is just the set of genes that or operons that are controlled by this common regulator protein. And you can see um, this is known as a FOP Regulon over here. FOP is the global regulatory protein and it can affect transcription of all four of these different genes which are indicated by arrows down on the bottom. So you've got a single protein affecting transcription of many different genes. And there's actually a way to make this even more complicated um, and organize it into what's known as a modulon, which is a set of operons that's controlled by a common regular protein, regulator protein, um, but then also each operon has its own unique regulatory machinery as well. And so um, the Regulon here only has one protein affecting all of these genes, whereas a Modulon would have the FOP protein, as well as several regulator proteins for each one of these individual genes. 
And so modulons are technically more complicated or more regulated than a regulon. And the next mechanism for global regulation that I'm going to talk about are two component systems. And two component systems are rarely well studied in bacteria, which is why we're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail. But they are present in all three domains of life. So bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes all have two component systems. And a two component system is <laughs> functions to respond to environmental stimuli, uh, specifically temperature, changes in osmolarity or salt levels, as well as oxygen levels. And a two component system is named as such because it's made up of two components or two proteins. A sensor kinase, you can see here in orange, and a response regulator you can see here in green. And the function of the sensor kinase is to sense the signal in the outside of the cell and communicate that signal to the inside. And it does this by autophosphorylating or phosphorylating itself. It is a kinase. It is an enzyme that phosphorylates. And so it can also phosphorylate itself. And then transmit the signal to the response regulator, which is another protein that when phosphorylated can elicit um, a specific response in the cell. Most response regulators are transcription factors or proteins that will increase or decrease transcription. And when they are phosphorylated, they can bind to DNA um, and exert their effects. One particular two component system that I'm going to ask you to know for this class is the ENVZ OMPR system. And the overall outcome of this system or the overall purpose of it is to control production of porin proteins in the outer membrane of bacteria. And this is a system that exists in E. coli. And what porin proteins do in that outer membrane um, are allow water transport in and out. So they're basically just channels that allow transport. And they have different diameters. Um, OMPF has sort of a wider diameter channel which allows more things in and out, whereas OMPC is a little bit narrower and is more selective because of that. And the ENVZ OMPR system is a two component system. And so it has a sensor kinase, which is the seafoam green ENVZ here, transmembrane protein. This can sense the osmolarity or the salts concentration outside. And then the response regulator, which is this purple protein here called OMPR. OMPR is a transcription factor, and so it can bind to the promoter regions of DNA and regulate transcription of different genes. And so under normal kind of low salt conditions, ENVZ is not activated. OMPR is not phosphorylated. Um, but in this conformation, in a non-phosphorylated OMPR can bind to the OMPF promoter and promote transcription and expression of an OMPF protein. And there is no OMPC protein produced in this situation. So under low osmolarity decrease, in, there is a basically a turning off of OMPC gene expression and a turning on of OMPF. And that's because in a low salt condition, you want to make this wider set channel that can allow more, more water as well as any potential solutes that do exist out here in the external environment into the cell to be used um, for nutritional purposes. Now when the conditions have, are outside of the cell are high in salt or have high osmolarity, ENVZ, as a sensor kinase, can sense that salt, autophosphorylate itself, and then in addition, pass that phosphate to its response regulator, the OMPR protein, which when it's phosphorylated, is no longer able to make OMPF, but is now able to promote the transcription of OMPC, turning it on and producing this narrower set channel to reduce water loss to the external environment. And so this is just a summary figure of the same pathway. Um, this one is from your book from Prescott.
And you can see that both of these porin proteins, LMPC and LMPF, exist in the outer membrane. Your sensor kinase ANVZ is in the plasma membrane, um, and it has these sensor regions in the periplasmic space that can sense the high osmolarity, in this case, phosphorylate um, themselves, and then transfer that phosphate to the response regulator OMPR so that it can activate transcription of OMPC and stop transcription of OMPF. And so this would be in the high osmolarity situation. Now, in addition to these two component systems, there are some systems or mechanisms of global regulation that have extra steps in the middle. And so rather than passing their phosphate group directly from a kinase to a response regulator, there are some regulation systems that include additional proteins in the center, um, or like that can pass the phosphate group from the kinase to another intermediate, and then ultimately to the response regulator. And this passing or transfer of phosphate groups from one protein of an, to another is known as a phospho-relay system. Additionally, there are protein or molecules called second messengers, which are small molecules that get made in response to a signal. They get made in very, very high numbers, and they can transduce the um, or pass the message onto many different effectors and ultimately bring about responses to that signal. So rather than the sensor kinase directly phosphorylating a response regulator, like a two-component system, in the case of a second messenger system, inputs are sensed, and then second messengers are made in response. They're made in extremely high numbers, and because of that, they can act on many, many different effectors to um, create many different target responses. And some common second messengers, especially in bacteria, are cyclic um, nucleotides. This one in particular is cyclic GMP or cyclic guanosine monophosphate. Eukaryotic systems use a lot of cyclic AMP um, or cyclic adenosine monophosphate, as well as calcium ions as second messengers. And they are a nice way to take a one individual signal and then amplify it um, and affect a lot of different effectors to lead to many different outcomes from a single signal. And the last um, mechanism for global regulation that's specific to um, bacteria is the use of alternate sigma factors. And so sigma factor is a protein that binds to RNA polymerase and is required for transcription in bacteria. Different sigma factors can direct the RNA polymerase to different types of genes um, because each sigma factor is able to recognize a different promoter sequence depending on the sigma factor that you use to direct RNA polymerase. You can transcribe different sets of genes that you would need. Um, for example, down here there's a list of E. coli sigma factors and the genes that are targeted for transcription when they are bound to RNA polymerase.